especially if you're beginning to be a threat to his dark kingdom. Father God, say this with me, church. Father God, Father God help, me help me to keep in mind, keep in mind that, my that my struggle is not merely against flesh and blood, against flesh but it's against the rulers, against, against the authorities, against the, against, the against, the against the powers of this dark world, and oh God, it's against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. Help me, Lord. Say it with me. Help me, Lord. To be self-controlled. Help me, Lord. To stay on alert. Help me, Lord. To stay sober. For I know my enemy, the devil, he's prowling around like a roaring lion looking for somebody to devour. My faithful Father, speak to God right now. Whether I turn to the right, whether I turn to the left, cause my ears to hear your voice. Lord, let me hear your voice. Say it with me, church. Lord, let me hear your voice. Say, turn this way. Say, turn that way. Lord, let me hear your voice. Lead me and guide me. Lord, speak for your servant listens. Lord, speak for your child is looking for his father. Lord, you are our father, our heavenly father. Guide us into all truth. And the church believing said, Come on, let's worship this morning.
us in Jesus. Say in his name, the name above every other name, Jesus, we thank you, Lord. That, Lord, that you have come, that, Lord, that you have called, that, God, that you are here right now with us. And that, Lord, that you have not left us alone. Lord, you said in your word that you would not leave us without help, you would not leave us without comfort. Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit. Yes, we do, oh God. We thank you for the, the presence of God in our lives. But, God, we also thank you for the presence and the power of our local fellowship, of our local church. Because, God, that is how it was preordained. That was how God, your son, arranged it. That God, that we would be fitly joined together. Yes. And Lord, there are those right now that are wandering around in the desert. They're wandering around in the wilderness. And yes, Lord, that the devil, like a roaring lion, he's seeking who we can devour. Lord, we ask today, Lord, that you would protect even those who are wandering in the wilderness. They're wandering in darkness. They've wandered away from the safety of the flock of God. Yeah. Lord, we ask today, Lord, for a special anointing this morning. God, on each and every one that will hear this word. And Lord, for those who are singing praises today, Lord, that our praises would go up. Hallelujah. That God, that they would be something that you're enjoying yourself. That God, that we, it's a sweet savior to you. That God, it makes you feel better. Oh God, also that your glory would come down and fill this place. And Lord, let your manservant today, when, when he delivers the word, let your manservant do your word, no harm. But God, that the word would go out and would find ready bodies, able bodies, Lord, fertile soil. God, oh, hallelujah, God, hearts that are ready to receive the word of God and to apply the word of God. God, we ask you today, Lord, for a special anointing, God, to strengthen us together in our faith and in our resolve to become people of God, children of God. Yes, yes. Because, Lord, only you can crave that. Oh, Lord, we need your help today. We need your help today. Help us, oh God. Help us.
Father, this morning we thank you for the gift that has been given. And this morning, Lord, we will be receiving offerings, Lord, we'll be offering prayers, Lord, we'll be sharing the word of God, we'll be studying your word, and Lord, we know according to what we read just now, we believe it, that your word will give me life. And Lord, my hope and my desire is to be an instrument of your grace, to be an instrument of your mercy. That God, that we would, in all that we do, would magnify you. That, Lord, that those who see us would see Christ. That those who hear us would also hear Christ speaking to us, even through us. And we ask, Lord, today, that, Lord, that you would work in such a way that would make us that instrument that can stand against the gates of hell and it will not prevail against us. Because, Lord, if you're for us, who can stand against us? Today, Lord, we submit ourselves to your will. We submit ourselves to your word. And, and we are asking God today for you to use us for your good pleasure.
Can you put your hands together for the Lord this morning? Yeah. I want to have you just have a seat. Turn the lights back on if you would, please. And open your Bibles. We're going to jump right into this morning. Thank you, Brother John. One of the sons of thunder. Yes. Open your Bibles to Matthew in the 18th chapter. Matthew chapter 18. And I've come by this morning to tell you that you're not going to hear anything new today. But my prayer is that you'll have a new understanding. Yeah. And you'll be in a different place than you were when you first heard this word. When you first heard the counsel of God's word. When you first felt the presence of Jesus. When you first felt him prick your heart. When you first recognized he's the Savior and I need one. Yes. Along with that, he has other titles that goes with him. He is also Lord. And I'm hoping today you realize that you should submit yourself to his lordship in your life. Yes. Father, as we gather today, Lord, we thank you for your presence again. And we thank you for your word, which is true. And Lord, we thank you, God, that it will be fulfilled. Lord, let it be fulfilled in our ears today. And Lord, let it be planted in our hearts. And for those that are ready, Lord, let it spring forth and bring fruit. Let it cause the change that you sent it to, to do in Jesus' name. And everybody wanted a change? Amen. 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 Matthew chapter 18. Are you there yet? Yes. Is this a familiar text to you as you glance at it right now? Maybe you, maybe there's a, a title over uh, over the top of it. Maybe it's it's talking about who's the greatest. Maybe it's talking about children. Maybe, and, and, uh, is, is some of your Bibles got commentaries like that? This might be something that is familiar to you. But maybe before today you've never applied it like it's about to be applied to your own life. Verse 1. It says, at that time the disciples came to Jesus... Saying, somebody read what it says. Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? All right. Then Jesus called a little child to him and sent him in the midst of them and said, somebody read it. Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives, listen to this, verse 5, whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Amen. Some of you heard me speak this, and I believe that it's true. I mean, I know in the, in the church at large, they have many children's programs and, and Sunday schools and things that are out there. And there's all sorts of resources. But it's still yet sometimes that I have seen and I've been there where a church is caught up in the program. Amen? And they forget where the ministry is supposed to be being conducted, who it's for, and who we represent. I have been and I've experienced as people think that because they hold the office of a Sunday school teacher or some other sort of a children's minister, that they think it's about them when it's not. Today, I, I, I submit this to you that many of us here in our congregation have got a serious problem because you're asking the same question. Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? You're jockeying for a position. Now, and I don't have time for this. Maybe it'll come in another message. But you're, what's this? You're jockeying for a position. You're competing for a seat. You're competing for the best seat in the house. You want to be right there up front with Jesus. Amen. Just to let you know that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good aspiration. It's, it's, a good, it's a good thought. You know, we, we heard this morning uh, in, the, uh, in the Sunday school, I heard if a man seeks to be a bishop or a leader or a or a pastor or something. He, he seeks a good thing. But then there are prerequisites to be qualified for that position. Yes. Can I tell you that if you want to be the greatest in heaven, there is a prerequisite. How many of you want to get to heaven? Amen. You want to get, get to heaven somehow. 
Somehow he knows only one way. Jesus. Now we say Jesus, but how many of you know what that even means? I mean, think about this. We think that because we, we say the name of Jesus, it's an automatic pass. You come to the gates of heaven and you say, uh, Jesus. Now from behind the gates, he might say, yes, somebody call. Or he might say, who are you? I don't know you. No, Hold on now. There's a prerequisite. There's another story in the Bible, which we're not going to hit much. But then what, what we see is that there were some people who came and they took the best seats. Some other people came in who was of lower, less, I would say, a lower, a lesser reputation. Some other people came in, and those people who took the front seats, the best seats, were asked to move, please, for these people. Can I tell you today that unless you get to this place and, and start listen, preferring your brother more than yourself, you know, uh, there was a book, and I can't remember who wrote it. Uh, it. It may come to me later, but uh, it, it has something to do with everything you ever need to learn in life. You learned in kindergarten. Or by, by the time you got to get a garden. How, how about how many of you were ever taught to share? Mm -hmm. Anybody, were you taught to share as a child? Yes. Uh, did you forget? Yeah. <laughs> no. Here, listen, in Mark chapter 10, verse 14, he says, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven. So today we're still on the, on the idea of God's will for your life and choosing where that's going to be. And how many of you want to have that place in heaven? Yes, amen. You know, you want to be able to say, I've got a place in glory land that outshines the sun. Somebody say amen. Amen. Now, just to be clear, it would be sad if on your, uh, you're departing from this world that your place in glory land remains vacant. Mm -hmm. Hello? Yes. We don't want that to happen. No. Turn your name and say, I'm looking forward to seeing your house. I'm looking forward to seeing your house. And, if you, and, you can, and I'll share mine with you. Amen. So I want to talk to you today about this. Suffer the little children. Suffer the little children. Jesus says, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. I have to hit this at least once. This nail. And when I say hit the nail, I wonder if, now are we, I wonder if as a people, as a world, are we hitting the nails in the cross of Christ again? In 1973, Roe versus Wade Supreme Court decision was, le it legalized abortion. That decision matters because more than 50 million Babies have been legally aborted in the last 40 or 50 years. Now, here's a way to think about that. Let me give you something. because I, I take, take the population of Georgia, the population of Michigan, the population of Virginia, Nebraska, and Nevada, include Iowa, and oh, throw Indiana in there for good measure, uh, and the, the population of North Dakota, the population of Rhode Island, the population of Arizona, plus the population of Oregon, and the population of Kansas, Include that the Vermont and plus the population of Mississippi and Alaska. When you add all this together, what we're saying, listen to what I'm telling you. That is 14 states that were legally wiped out. Are you listening to me? Yes. 14 states of the Union were wiped out. That's what we've done in America since 1973. And that's what's still going on. In 2009, 41% of all the viable pregnancies in New York City were ended in abortion. 41%. And it's hard to know what to do with a number like that. 50 years later, after Roe versus, Roe versus Wade, abortion remains a divisive is issue in American politics. And, and, and But there is one hopeful note. I read some statistics recently from the, uh, the Gallup poll on abortion. It shows that support for pro-life is finally rising since 1996 because it wasn't on the rise. 
it was almost 50-50 right up to 1996. And so far into this decade, we're seeing a little bit of a change of the wind, if you, if you will. So there is some hope because in the year 2020, 50% of those surveyed, they considered themselves pro-life. While 41% pro-choice. Now you say, well, those are just numbers. They're just, you know, of course, they didn't survey everybody. Nobody asked. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and say, nobody asked me. Well, what would you be? Would you be? Which side would you be on? And, and get this. This was an interesting prospect as well. And I looked at this thing and I found out that more than more than 50%, nearly 60% of the men were pro-life. But almost 60% of the women were pro-choice, which means the babies are a minority rule. See, because this is a sensitive issue, how many know it's a pretty sensitive issue? Yes. Some people, they get all riled up about it, amen? So we need to, amen? amen? Many people prefer not even to think about it. That might be most of us that's listening right now. I don't want to listen to this right now. But we need to know what's going on in the world. In any congregation, you're going to find a broad spectrum of opinions and, and a broad spectrum of experiences. You're going to have some who are angry. You're going to have some who are brokenhearted. You're going to have some who are guilty. You're going to find some that are chained to the past. You're going to find some, they're frustrated. You're going to find some, they don't really know where they stand. And you're going to find the rest of them, they want to change the topic, change the subject. Don't want to talk about it. I mean, it's almost impossible to find anybody who is truly neutral. Choose this day. Life or death. How should we approach this issue? I, I, I want you to really pay close attention because we need to learn how to approach these issues because it's a serious matter. Interestingly enough, anybody who's hearing this message right now, you're already born. Amen? And some of you are wondering if, and there are people out there, I know there are people who I wish I'd never been born. Hold on, stop right there. Let's, somebody needs to tell them about Jesus. Amen? Amen. But I wonder what Jesus would say about abortion. How would he feel about all that's going on in the world today? What if we were, what if he were, what if he were walking among us today? Is there any way to be sure about what he might say, what he might do? Well, we can begin with one obvious fact. Jesus never directly addressed the issue. Amen? Have you ever looked it up in the Bible, trying to find out? Well, let me see if I can find this in the Bible. Jesus never addressed the issue directly. And, and why might that be? Well, the reason I found historically is that in Israel... God's chosen people, there was no note, there was no historic account of them doing this thing where they killed their children. Because it was considered to be a pagan practice. Because the Jews in Jesus' day did not kill their unborn children. There was no reason for Jesus to speak directly to this case. So if we ask, what would Jesus do today, we're not asking the right question, I don't think. I think what we ought to ask is, what did Jesus do and what did he say? What did he do? What did he say? Somebody say the word. Nobody can say the word? Somebody say the word. Jesus. Somebody say the word. Jesus. It's pretty easy. The word. Somebody say the word. Thank you very much. Is anybody here with me this morning? Apparently, you're finally with me. Now, listen, the preacher does this because he wants to make sure you're on the same tracks. Some of you just went that way. He said, whoa, wait a minute. Get back here. Are we on the same page this morning? Yes, sir. Because, see, the gospel leaves us with some important clues of how Jesus would respond. None more important than this. How did Jesus treat children? How did he treat them? Well, as I looked through scripture recently, I found out a couple of occasions where he dealt directly with children. The first was recorded in Matthew 18 and Mark 9. 
The second was mentioned in Matthew 19, Mark 10, and Luke 18. You know what I found out? They all pretty much say the same thing. If you look it up, you'll find out it's pretty much the same account. You've got three witness, three witness accounts in Ma Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they're all saying, hey, this is what happened. So, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, can you believe it today? This is what happened. Amen. But let's begin with something here, because we got to begin with a, a statement of a basic principle from an incident that was recorded in Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. And it's in verse 13 and 15. And he said, Suffer the little children to come unto me. And what? And forbid them not. Forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. Amen. Suffer the little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of God. I know you think that's kind of cutesy, and some of you might remember years or decades ago, man, we used to hear this in Sunday school, and we'd hear this in church once in a while, but have you really applied it? Have you really looked into what how Jesus responded to children? Well, I mean, to most of us, it's a nice story that we heard in church. But let's, if you would, if you will, if you walk with me, let's find out what Jesus did, because this has been called the Magna Carta of children. These are some of the simplest words that Jesus ever spoke. Only hard hearts would not be moved by them. Some of us were just so stubborn, we're not really understanding what Jesus' attitude was towards this. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not. What did he say? Do not hinder them. Well, what about me, Pastor? Well, uh, first off, are you a child of God or not? I'm a grown man. Don't be calling me no child. And besides, I, had, I actually had this happen. And besides that, you know, Paul said, when I was a child, I act like a child. So you're acting like one right now. <laughs> so apparently, you're in good company because you're still a child. But you're not a child of God unless you understand what the will of God is for your life. Amen. The Bible says we are to become as children. Yes. Amen. So I, 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 was, I was moved as I read this again. And there were several events that had taken place over the last several weeks that just, just set me on fire, if you will. It got my attention. That's what that means. If anything sets you on fire, it gets your attention. Anybody ever put your hand in a fire and you, you really didn't mean to put your hand in a fire, but it got your attention? Yes, it Somebody say amen. Amen. <laughs> or you say I did. <laughs> we'll get out of the fire. Uh, I got your attention now, but here's what we got to look at. I was touched by some things, some observations I made. Because what we find out is that Jesus, he responded spont spontaneously. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. When he had placed his hands on them, he went from there, amen? But here's what happens. He didn't waste any time. He was what? What's that word there? Spontaneous. I want you to notice something here. I want you to notice... God's will, God's desire. This is my desire. You sang the song. Can I get a witness this morning? You want to be used by God? Yes. <clears throat> Look at this. Look at his spontaneous desire of parents. A responsibility for parents to bring their children to him. Suffer the little children to come unto me. Amen. When Luke tells the story, if you look it up in, in Luke chapter 1, he uses a Greek word for babies. It's, it's the same word that he used for John the Baptist leaping for joy in his mother's womb. Think about that for a second. It's pretty exciting, isn't it? Instantaneously, there's a response. Jesus is responding. Bring those children to me. Now, I want to back up again because I got the slides out of order, but look at what he says. He says here, when he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. What does that say to you? First, he addressed the children. He laid the hands on the children. Yes. Then he went on and took care of other business. Somebody say amen. Amen. How many can see that he prefers children over adults? Maybe. In many ways, it's true. First off, how many of you know that children, uh, well, they need help. Babies, when they're born, they're totally helpless. Babies, when they're born, they can't care for themselves. No. They, the only thing they can do is mess themselves. Some of us adults are still good at that. I'm going to let that sink in for a minute. 
And once in a while, we still need somebody to change us. I'm going to let that sink in for a minute. And just so you know, don't hate the one who's trying to change you. Don't despise that person who comes to you sharing the truth in love. But listen, but receive the word of God. Receive the word of God. And be ready and willing to make the change. One day, not only will you be able to change yourself, help yourself, but you'll be able to help your brother, your sister. You'll be able to help your, amen. your neighbor. Somebody amen. say amen. amen. And the other thing we notice in this response, I go back to here, again, the spontaneous desire of the parents to bring their children to Jesus. Suffer those little children. Bring them kids to me. Amen? But we look at the disciples, and they were reluctant to even let the kids get near. Just so you know, so many of you might, might find you might be encouraged to know you're disciples of Christ, but you're like this. You're reluctant to deal with children. Can I tell you that? Oh, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Can I tell you this? To be reluctant for dealing with children might mean that you don't have Jesus inside. That could be true. <clears throat> See, how typical is this? How very modern this is. Children should be seen and not heard. We, we, we get a task for it. We get all task oriented. We get busy saving the world that we don't want the children to bother the Savior. We get so busy with our things that are going on in the life. How strange, how sad, and yet how often it happens when children kind of take the back seat. The disciples were like the president's bodyguard. If you can imagine that. These children were, were coming towards him, and there were well wishers that were coming from a distance and to the disciples. Get this, to the disciples, these children were just going to be a distraction. They were just going to be a disturbance. They were just going to be a hindrance for Jesus. But the message says, but Jesus, get this, the message Bible translates it this way, but Jesus was irate. He was, listen, he was irate. Somebody tell me what irate means. You're upset. He wasn't very happy. He was irate with them, and he let them know, hey, bring those children to me. Yes. I don't know, maybe, if, what's the matter with you? Bring those kids here. That would be me. Maybe Jesus did the same thing. I'm not sure. I don't know. He was irate. How did Jesus look when he was irate? Have you ever seen an irate Jesus before, anybody? I mean, you want to see him irate. No. I don't want to see him irate. No, let's not upset Jesus today. But the other thing we see, the third observation I made is his indignation at those who would keep children away from him. And in Mark's version of this incident, in Mark chapter 10, verse 13 to 16, he uses a word that means Jesus was upset by what his disciples did. Some translations say that he became angry. I kind of like the message where he was irate. The uh, English revised version says this. He did not like his followers telling the children not to come. The Message Bible says, again, that Jesus was irate with them. And what did he do? He let them know. Jesus was irate. And he let them know. I have decided to follow Jesus. And here's, this, is, this is rather, I think, important as well. Only those who are like children can come at all. What are we talking about? Those who are like children. He says, I assure you, whoever does not welcome the kingdom, listen, does not welcome the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. I don't know, but I'm thinking maybe, I'm thinking maybe that when he said that, he might have shocked some big shots. He might have shocked some people that thought, wait a minute, I thought I was one of your favorite disciples. He might have shocked some people that thought, well, wait a minute, I've, I've, been, I've been in this for a long time. How can you say, how, how, he might have shocked the big shots, those who thought more of themselves than they ought to. And I think that's the problem with many of us today. You're thinking higher of yourself than you ought to. Now, just to be clear, you shouldn't think lower either. I'm a grown man. I'm not going to be like a child. I don't know about you, but I want to be a child of the king. Amen? I mean, at that moment, at that very moment, that very instant, the children were closer to Jesus 
than those disciples who had been with Jesus all this time, who had tried to keep other people away. When, he tried to, when they tried to keep the children away, those children were actually closer to Jesus. But I also saw something else, and this is, I want you to hear this right now. Maybe, maybe, you, maybe you forgot this part. Because Jesus showed a willingness to embrace those children and bless those children. Maybe right now because of your makeup, because of your attitude, because of maybe you're going to blame your past. Maybe you're going to blame the way you were or were not raised. Whatever. Maybe you're going to, well, I'm not touchy-feely. Maybe I don't care what it is, but I'm here to tell you, if you're going to be like Jesus, you need to hear this right now. He had a willingness to embrace children and bless them. Mark chapter 10, verse 16, it says, He took the children in his arms, and he placed his hands on them, and he blessed them. No wonder parents love him. I mean, if you show kindness to my children, it means more than if you had shown kindness to me. Little children are smarter than we think, I'm thinking. They know when they're loved. They know when someone really cares for them. And did you know what they do? They respond with love to those who love them. No wonder children flocked to him. Just think of it. The parents, they wanted their, they wanted their children to come to Jesus. The boys and the girls, they're not afraid of him. And he picked them up in his arms. And then he put his hands on them and blessed them. You see, what happens is that their innocence, their helplessness, appealed to this king. Jesus will not turn away children. It is Christ-like to love children. It is Christ-like to care for children. It's Christ-like to welcome children. It's Christ-like to embrace children. It is like Jesus to become indignant at those who would mistreat those children, who would reject those children, who would push them out. Jesus is the little child's best friend. Maybe you forgot that part. You see, his blessing has brought its benediction wherever his name has been heard. Christianity has always been the religion of listen, that safeguarded the rights of children. You see, wherever the gospel goes, listen to what I'm saying now. Wherever the gospel goes, it honors families. Whenever, wherever the gospel goes, it ennobles motherhood. Wherever the gospel goes, it protects and it preserves the place of children. Where Christ is known and trusted, where Christ is known and trusted and followed, and where his example is the model, their infancy is sacred and children are safe. So here's a solemn warning. Lest we miss the seriousness of Matthew chapter 18. It includes another story that starts as a question. Here it goes. Go back to the first beginning. Lord, who is the greatest in the kingdom? Some of us need to understand something. You might be the king of your house. You might be the queen of your house. But, it, but you, you, are you the Lord of that home? Or is Jesus the Lord? Is he sitting on the throne? Strange that Jesus handpicked men who asked a question like that. You know, in those days, the men ruled. Men ruled. Somebody say amen. Yeah. From the beginning, it was supposed to be men that took responsibility. It was supposed to be men that would protect their families. It was supposed to be men so I'm encouraged to find out that the statistics are proving that men, more men, are pro-life than, 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 than some others in regards to protecting a child. 
You would think that having followed that master for many months and his disciples, uh, you know, listen, all, <laughs> his disciples would know how Jesus felt about children. But apparently even the disciples of Christ, those who were closest to him, they still had this, this problem in their mind, this problem in their, their character, in their, in their idea of life. And, and you, you know, how many of you know, if you see it, uh, the, the, the pictures of the Last Supper, and, and you read the story about that, they, were, they, were, they would compete with who would get sit next to Jesus. Yes. I wonder, I don't know, I, I never looked this up, but maybe it would be nice to know. Were there any children in that upper room? I don't know. I don't see them in the picture. But in my mind, I'm thinking, I know why I didn't see them in the picture. Brother, let me tell you, you want to know why you don't see them in the picture? You might want to take a guess. They're yeah, they're sitting at his feet. They're all under the table. Amen? Because that's the way to get close to Jesus. That leads me to another story about this woman who clawed her way through a crowd to get to Jesus. Somebody say amen. Yeah. Some of us, we want to pray it around like a peacock. I'm coming to Jesus. Look at me. That's okay. As long as you're not getting in the way of those children. Now, children, uh, we're talking about children. I'm talking about natural children. We're talking about that by age, by, by, by infants and, and toddlers and, and grade schoolers and middle schoolers and high schoolers. These are children. And, and then, then we're also talking about children who are over 60. Okay. Talk to my wife. She'll tell, she'll tell you she's raising her boy. But it is strange that Jesus' hand-picked men would ask the question, Lord, who's the greatest in the kingdom? Children. But it sees human nature. That's what we see. Why? Because human nature doesn't seem to die very easy, does it? No. I suppose that's why we have to, watch this, Consciously put to death. We have to crucify the flesh. We have to do what? Die daily. Because there's this man that's called the old man. Maybe you've never seen, never even putting that together. You know, put to death the old man and his works and all that and his tendencies. Put those all to death. It is a message I'll probably be preaching in the near future again. I've never preached it twice, but I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to be preaching a message called Let the Boy Live. So Jesus took a child. He took that child and he had him stand right there in his midst. And as the disciples looked at this young boy, they wondered what did Jesus mean? Did he really mean to say it like that? I mean, the answer, I think, was pretty simple. The answer is clear. Listen to this. Unless you change and become like a little child, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. And then the direct answer to the question, verse 4, whoever humbles himself like a child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Wait, where, there's the answer. The question in verse 4, the disciples asked, who's the greatest? The answer in verse 4. It took a moment for a couple of verses for him to come around to the direct answer. But can you, are you seeing the clarity in this this morning? But then comes the heart of the message for us today. Because in the next few verses, Jesus tells us why children matter much, so much to him, and why they should matter to us. And let me give you just a couple of principles. The first principle, if I get it up there right. When we welcome a child in Jesus' name, somebody finish that. We are welcome in Jesus' name. When we welcome a child in Jesus' name, we are welcoming Jesus himself. And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. I didn't make this up. Right there it is in black and white. Verse 5. So that statement, if you think about this, man, this, this is huge. This is a game changer for many of us. How we feel about having children. How we respond to the cultural pressure. For, for, you know, for radical feminism and how we react to the burden of childbearing. I mean, my, my youngest daughter is about to give birth to another daughter and I, I don't know, I, I, someone said, how do you feel about that? I said, I don't know. 
I'm smiling the whole time. But why does he say that to welcome a child, a little child, is to welcome him? It's kind of easy. Did you know that Jesus was born? He was a baby. He was born. He was once a baby. And did you know that the reverse is also true? When we reject our children, we are rejecting Christ himself. Did you hear what I'm saying? When you reject a child, when you neglect a child, all these things you're doing to Jesus. Recall that young Mary, she was pregnant. And when she was pregnant, it was some, um, well, under some circumstances that today, routinely, they would terminate that pregnancy. But in an important theological context of Christmas, the killing of an unborn child is a symbolic killing of the Christ child. Number two, when we deliberately harm a child, oh, come on, we face unspeakable judgment. If you uh, listen to me, listen very carefully. You may not have been called to be a Sunday school teacher. You may not have been called to do this, that, and other thing. It might not be your place in life to even bear children as a woman, which is another touchy subject. But can I tell you that every one of us, we are supposed to become as children, but we're also supposed to respect and honor children. Yes. Amen? Amen. Listen to what it says in, in this verse here. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin... It would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Listen, this is a literal warning right here. Literally, he's warning against those who cause little children to stumble. What does Jesus mean by this? Well, I think it means to lead them into sin, to tempt them to evil, to hurt the child, to abuse the child, to neglect the child, to ignore the child, to expose the child to danger, and ultimately to harm or physically injure a child, either physically or spiritually. Any way that you harm a child, unspeakable judgment. You see, when we reject our children, we're rejecting Christ. When we abuse a child, we're abusing Christ. Is anything that we, listen, anything that we do that causes harm to come to our children? I want you to know that Jesus applies this, how, how he does this. He says, these little ones who believe in me. So it's kind of teaching us a pretty vital truth. Sometimes we wonder, can a child truly believe in Jesus? I'm going to ask you, like, how many think you think they can believe, really believe in Jesus? It, even since I've been here, I've heard it from the mouths of our own people. Well, you know, I don't know if they even, that child even knows what it means to be saved. Well, guess what? A majority of people in churches today can't explain what it means. Hello? Maybe there's something that needs to be changed in the way we see children and how we see ourselves. Are you saved? Someone would say. Some used to answer, I hope I am. What do you mean you hope you are? You either are or you're not. I and mean, if you if you have any, I don't know about you, but if you've got any question about the matter, don't you think you might want to get to the altar and have a little talk with Jesus? And I want you to know that yes, indeed, and they can believe. And if we've raised our children, if we would raise our children in the truth of God, here's what we should do. We should expect them to believe. So let us pray to that end. And let us work to that end. Let us ask God to save our children at an early age. Show of hands, how many came to Jesus at a later age in life? Anybody? How many wish that maybe you'd come to Jesus beforehand? Because going back to this, some people actually mock the faith of a child. You know, that, that's a, ter a terrible thing to do, to mock a child's faith. 
Some cast doubt. We make jokes as if only the adults can believe and understand Jesus. I'm here to tell you today, I still don't quite fully understand Jesus. Hello? Can I get a witness? I still can't fully comprehend Christ. Even though I can't fully understand God, I'm just being, I, can't, I want to be real. I want to be emptied inside. Amen? Just like the song says. How sad and how tragic, but truly evil that we should make fun of God's little children. Here's what Charles Spurgeon had to say in this comment about do, do not hinder the children. Listen to this. Charles Spurgeon wrote this. People occasionally say of such a one, he is only fit to teach children. He's no preacher. I tell you in God's sight, he is no preacher who does not care for the children. John Piper, some of you might know, be more familiar with that name because he's got radio programs and TV programs, books out there that people read. And from his book called Let, Let the Children Come to Me, he offers this warning to those who be little children. Listen to this. If you are receiving the kingdom yourself like a little child, then you will not do anything to hinder little children from coming to Jesus. But if you're trying to enter the kingdom some other way than by, re by receiving it like a child, then you will probably be a hindrance to those children. And if you're not childlike towards God, children will probably be beneath you and not worth your time. That's right. Let me help you out. Children will come to Jesus if you don't get in their way. You see, our responsibility is not so much to bring them to Christ as to get things out of the way to hinder them not, to prevent them not. I read this somewhere, and I don't know where I got it, but I, I had to make note of it. But let me, let me give you this. Children naturally, this won't tell me, Children naturally love Jesus. Now I write this down as I'm thinking about this. I don't know how, where it came from or anything, but I'm thinking about this. We, we, are, we are taught in Scripture that we're, we're born with a sinful nature. But wait, our nature for a child, when it's a child, they naturally love Jesus. What happened to us when we grew up? Well, I'm not a child anymore. Oh, but children naturally love Jesus. You know, that, that statement, it, to me, it strikes me as true if, if by it we mean something like this. Just as the children in Jesus' day knew that he was their friend, even so children today love to hear about him. If we would just tell the story of Jesus, our children will be drawn to him. Let, let me, listen to this. When children come in, stop with this, well, I can't play with them anymore, I'm this and I'm that, I'm too old, this and that, you can't tell them about Jesus, I'm sorry for you. Yes. All it requires is that we tell them the stories about Jesus, and they get, are you hearing what I'm telling you? Did you know that the word of God will draw them in? And it's not just the word, it's the Holy Spirit that confirms the word in that child's heart. But here's what we've done for more way too many years. We have negated the Holy Spirit. We have cut the word of God out. We've cut the children out. Yes. No wonder why in America it's legal to cut a living baby out of a mother's womb. Because we don't think anything more of it. Or maybe it's because we can't think about it. Can I tell you that Jesus thinks about it? He thinks about it. If we would but tell the story to Jesus, looking for an opportunity to share the words of Christ to them, to tell them about the virgin birth, to tell them all, the, all that he's done and about the miracles, and tell them the Old Testament story, and even though today in the schools they're going to try to get, oh, there's no way a whale could have, could have swallowed anybody. I mean, are you getting this this morning?
But then we're going to have the face of judgment if we're not doing these things. Judgment of eight, Matthew 18 and 6. See, in the ancient world, listen to this, in the ancient world, the farmers would take fleshly harvested grain and grind it between two heavy stones. It's called a millstone. You might not know, I'm going to just talk to you about a millstone. <laughs> that millstone was huge. That millstone was heavy. That millstone had to be pulled wherever it was going by a donkey. Can you imagine the depth of the sea? It represents the deepest, darkest, the most turbulent spot in the face of the planet. If you hang a millstone around a man's neck, drop him off the edge of the, uh, of the boat, there he goes, down to the depths of the sea. He most certainly will drown and perish. And he'll be in darkness. That millstone makes his death doubly sure. He ain't coming back. It speaks of a terrible, agonizing death. Jesus said the judgment of those who harm his children is much worse than that. Whoa, did you not catch that? It will be, it will be worse than having a millstone hung around your neck. So I'm going to have to ask the question, what does Jesus say about those who make a living by killing babies? What, what of those who make millions in the, in the evil abortion industry? What of the cowardly politicians who vote for it? I heard a politician say this recently. Not going to mention names because there are probably many of them. The reason that they support it is because they want to serve their voters. What? They get this. They, do you not know that a politician is going by, he's going by the popular vote? Yes. If we would rise up against these things, as Jesus would, perhaps the vote would swing another way. Amen? I mean, I would not want to be in their shoes when judgment day comes. Well, uh, being a being that politician. Well, you know, Jesus, I, I was just you know, answering the people's desires. So, listen, choose this day who you're going to serve. Are you trying to please man? Or do you want to please God? God. And the church all said, what? God? God. Now, I know some people want to take, take issue, but I, want to, I got to share this quote that came from Pope John Paul II. Listen to what he says. Whoever attempts to destroy human life in the womb of a mother not only violates the sacredness of the living, growing, and developing human being, and thus he opposes God. But he also attacks society by undermining the respect for all human life. Mm -hmm. Suffer the little children to come. Amen? Amen. Yes. When we protect children from harm, somebody read what it says. We are only we are doing, doing what God has already done. done. We're only doing what God has already done. You want to be used by him? Is that your desire to be used by God? Listen in verse 10, it says, See that you do not look down on one of these little ones, for I tell you, that's this, that there are angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. Check out that phrase. Their angels. Their, these children have angels in heaven. Their angels in heaven. Is, is this reference, is it, maybe it's a reference to what we commonly call a guardian angel? Some of you were here and you watched the movie this week. I am Gabriel. What a, that was, it was, it was, I, I can't, I'm speechless. It was a great movie, amen? Dynamic. But perhaps, certainly it means that the angels of God watch over children. Yes. And what do they do? What do those angels do? They protect them, they care for them, they watch over them. You know, I think I've learned something about this. <laughs> Ever since uh, grandchildren started popping up in my lifetime. Um, I mean, there's some things that my kids do, and, and I remember some of those things. There are some things my grandchildren do. I have memories about those as well. And I'm not sure. I, they're, they're both precious, and they're precious memories kind of a thing. But honestly, whether it's my children or my grandchildren, some of you will agree with this. I will do whatever I can to help them. They don't have to ask me. They don't have to ask. 
They are, and, and honestly, my grandchildren, my children, and get this, whether they're my natural born children or other children, from men, uh, my, my spiritual children, they're never far from my mind, and no one has to remind me to think about them. Even as I, even right now as I'm saying this, and even as I was going over these words, as I was going over my notes for the message today, as I was writing this down, I got to tell you, my kids and my grandkids and your kids and other people's kids, kids all over, all over half of this country were coming into my mind. And some of them aren't kids. They're not children anymore. Some of them, they've grown up and they've got kids, and some of their kids have got kids. And I thank God for the memories. And I thank God to know that many of them are still serving the Lord Jesus. Yes, amen. So when I think about my, my daughters, when I think about my sons, my, my, my grandsons, uh, I have sons, by the way, just Debbie didn't have to give birth to them. <laughs> Somebody else had to labor and get them out. Um, anyway. They are never far from my mind. But how much more, how much more will God take care of my children and my grandchildren? I mean, if I, a very imperfect father, a very imperfect grandfather, feel the way about my children and grandchildren, how much more does God love them? How much more will God take care of them? How much more will God watch out for them? How much more will God reward their trusting hearts? I mean, if my children are precious to me, if my grandchildren mean so much to me, do they mean any less to God? Because they are far more precious. For, you know why? Because he sends angels to watch over them. Yes. They watch while they sleep. Sometimes when I'm busy, I thank God that I believe that God's got angels watching over my kids. I don't think about it quite often, but the Lord never forgets. But I gotta, I gotta ask. I don't understand God. I don't understand Christ. I don't have complete knowledge. It just blows my mind. I can't comprehend how He can remember them all. I mean, sometimes I can't even keep their names straight mm -hmm. when they're right in front of me. Mm -hmm. Ask my kids. Ask my grandkids. <laughs> Brittany, I mean Ashley, Jax, I mean Aiden, whoever you are, whoever you are, whichever one you are. Yeah, you know who you are. Honestly, I some can't some, I can't remember things about my kids and grandkids, but I am sure that God knows my children by name, individually and personally, and he remembers everything about them. He knows which is and he knows which is which, and he never gets them mixed up. The angels who watch over my children and grandchildren, they're in the presence of God. Yes. Nothing ever goes unnoticed. Amen. So what are we doing? We're doing the work of God. When we protect a child from harm, we're only doing what God has already done. We're doing the work of Jesus. Amen. You see, our God sees, our God knows all the little children of the world. Every time that we move with love and compassion on behalf of a child, whether born or unborn, we're doing that which is dear to the heart of God. And I'm going to declare to you that what I believe. The Lord Jesus is on the side of those who love little children. I mean, no, you've got to really love. You can't just love in word only. The Lord Jesus is on the side of those who truly love little children. And we are on his side when we stand up for them. We're doing what Jesus would do, aren't we? When we stand up for them. We're doing what he did. When he took the children into his arms and he blessed them. I mean, in the widest embrace, if you think about this, this principle involves all those who love children. It includes an army of doctors and nurses and who treat infants and young boys and girls. It includes the, those who teach children. It, it certainly includes those who rescue children from brutality and abuse and exploitation. God blesses every Sunday school teacher who comes in week after week preparing a lesson for a child. 
God blesses every Vacation Bible School volunteer. He blesses everybody who sings and leads children in worship. God blesses those who would, who would dare to lead a backyard Bible study or club. God blesses those who take care of foster children, those who adopt children, those who care for children with special needs. God blesses those who lead children's church and, and give children's sermons on Sunday mornings. God blesses those who write good books for children and design safe play toys. And throw that in there. Oh, and he blesses those who will sing with them, even though they can't carry a tune in a basket. <laughs> yes. But there is more that needs to be said. I think there's more that needs to be said about the tragedy of abortion. And there are many ways of aborting. We're talking about, you know, aborting a, a human life that is yet born. But some of us have aborted spiritual children as well. Uh, that'll be another message. But, you know, when we give our money to those who help unwed mothers, we're doing the work of Jesus. When, when we give our time to counsel the confused, we're doing the work of Jesus. When, when we urge our leaders to protect the unborn, we're doing the work of Jesus. When we speak out on behalf of those who have no voice, we're doing the work of Jesus. When we risk misunderstanding and embarrassing to save lives, we're doing the work of Jesus. As the old chorus says, Jesus loves the little children, all the little children of the world. We need only to add that he loves those little children even before they have ever come out of the womb. Let me, let me summarize this message. Because there are a lot of reasons why we oppose abortion. And the chief among them is this. We are for Jesus, and Jesus is for children. Let me give you something maybe you know, click in your mind. Tricks are for kids. Remember, some of us are old enough to remember the the commercials. Tricks are for kids. That may be tricks are for kids. But Jesus is for children. Amen. See, that is why it said, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Yes. Our children can teach us so much. We can learn so much from, from teaching them. We look at our own child. I read this from uh, a book written by uh, Thomas Ed Ed Elkins. Listen to what he says. He said, we look at our own child, Jenny, who has Down syndrome, and we see our, limit, our limitedness. She shows us love even when we at first were not totally accepting her. These kids love us until we begin to love them back. And by loving them, we learn a whole new definition of loving something very akin to grace. Special needs children. I don't have time to spend much time there, but some of us, if you even bring it up, you'd have to agree, I'm not even sure how I would handle that. I mean, I am so grateful. My children were perfect. They didn't look like Martians when they came out. They had ten fingers and ten toes. And I'd have to say, probably up until a certain age, they were model children, model kids. Then they modeled something else when they became teenagers. But, but here's what I say. Raise a child up in the way that they should go. Amen? Raise a child. In, are you hearing what I'm telling you? Is that not what Jesus would do? Suffer the little children to come to me. Raise them up. Our children teaches us that you don't have to be perfect to be loved. Our children teaches us you don't have to be perfect to lead them to Jesus. Love is deeper than that. You don't have to have a spotless record. You Listen, you can be the world's biggest failure and you're still loved by a child. That's grace. And you know we can learn that from kids. Which leads me to ask this personal question. The personal question I have for you is, do you want to go to heaven? I don't want anybody to miss this this morning. And if, if someone's in here right, not in here right now, you need to be asking them this question. Say, do you want to go to heaven? 
Do you want to go to heaven? It's simple. It's really simple. Let me tell you how it is. Here's how it works. Truly, I tell you, unless you, be, you change and become like a little child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You want to go to heaven? Just become like a little child. Come to Jesus. And maybe right now, maybe you need to reiterate this, just to speak it out and remind yourself, Lord Jesus, I need you. Maybe you can even be honest right now. Could you lift up your hand and you say, Lord Jesus, I've, I've blown it again. But also leave your hand up and say, Lord Jesus, I'm still trusting you. You see, that's childlike humility, total dependence, complete honesty, no cover-ups, no gains, no pride, no conditions, no deals. Just, Jesus, I need you. I need you. So as you come to Jesus with these words, at least as I'm thinking, there's a familiar song. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. That verse tells us that Jesus saves us. Jesus loves us. He who died, that this in heaven's gate will open wide. He'll wash away my sin. Let his little children come in. Perhaps you should stop right now. Whatever you're doing, whatever's distracting you, maybe you'll have to close your eyes. Maybe you'll have to close your eyes and just imagine Jesus saying, come unto me, my child. And maybe this morning you say, but I'm not perfect. And that's the truth. But I want you to close your eyes and imagine saying, Jesus, Imagine Jesus saying, I know you're not perfect, but I still love you. That's grace. You know, you can enter into the kingdom of heaven if you want to. Because the door is wide open. Can you imagine right now? Can you just imagine right now with your eyes closed? Can you imagine right now that the door is open for those who are not ashamed to come as little children? Maybe you have to do like I do on a regular basis. Father, forgive me. I failed again. I sure could use a friend right now. What a friend we have in Jesus. You have a friend in Jesus. Jesus, I need a friend right now. Maybe you're here this morning. Maybe you're watching this morning and you say, well, Lord, yes, I sure could use a friend right now. What if I told you, not only do you have a friend in Jesus, but you have a lot of friends in Jesus' people. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. Oh, I'm reaching. 
reaching out, reaching out. If we never needed you, Lord, it's now. Right now, Lord, it's now. Right now. If you never needed
Lord, let their faith not fail them. Because if we've ever needed you, this is the times in which we reflect, this is the time in which we remember that Jesus, Jesus. Lord, there are those here this morning who need a physical touch in their lives. And Lord, we thank you right now that you already have your arms around them because they are your children. And Lord, when they go to their various doctors and their appointments, Father, we ask them that the miraculous will take place. That someone got another prayer through. And then the report comes back. We don't know how it happened, but it's happened. Lord, that they would be healed in Jesus' name. And for those who still have to go through certain procedures, we ask God that your hands would guide the hands of those who tend to those people. Whether through surgery or, or whether through whatever means is necessary to restore them to good health. But regardless of how it takes place, Lord, we want to give you all honor and glory this morning. Yes. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus. Sister Lynn, would you come forward? Aren't we glad that Jesus loves us? And I love that little song, Jesus Loves Me. That's one of the first ones when I was helping to raise, I want to say raise my grandchildren when we lived in Virginia. That's one of the first songs I taught Amber. And so, and then my other little ones that came up, now it's my great-grandchildren, because <laughs> all the grandchildren are having children. So it's our job as mothers, dads, grandparents, great-grandparents to still help train and raise our children whether they're ours or the neighbors or anybody that brings theirs in. So thank you, Pastor, for the word. Thank you so much. So we'll stand. It's good to see Sister Leo here today and clean. Yes. Everybody. Father in heaven, we thank you today for your love and your mercy, oh God. We yes. thank you that you love us. And Lord, that you want us to come as little children, Father. I pray that, dear God, you would help us to remember that, dear God. Lord, that we're your children, oh God, each and every day. And that it's okay if we, Lord, want to act like a child, but only do it, Lord, as obedient children unto you, Father yes. God. I love you, I praise you, and I thank you for this message. And I praise we go our separate ways, Lord, that we would, Lord, bless the little children that we may come in contact with today, Father, and every day. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for your blessings. And I thank you, Lord, for the children that are in my life, oh God. And I pray, dear God, I won't hurt them or harm them in any way. And I pray this for my brothers and sisters as well. I pray as we dismiss and go our separate ways, that you would lead, guide, and direct us today and protect us, oh God. That you would bring us back the next appointed time. And Lord, I pray for over the, the offering and over the luncheon that we're about to receive, Lord, that you would bless it to the nourishment of our bodies. And thank you for those that have all contributed one way or the other today. For it's in Christ's name I do pray. Amen. Amen.